Welcome to the Jason Wright Show. How are you doing, my man? Doing good, man. How about yourself? I'm great. We're talking about something that is near and dear to my heart. I'm very passionate about health and wellness. Obviously, both of us have, in one form or another, chosen this path as a vocation. And I love what I learned about you in preparing for this show is that we share an affinity for kind of that midpoint of life. I'm there. I'm obviously older than you. I mean, I turn 50 next year, man. <laughs> so, so I'm at that midpoint. And then one of the things I found really cool about your training specifically was you found a niche in helping women that were kind of reaching that midpoint of life and the hormonal changes that their bodies go through and that sort of thing. So here's what I want to do. I want to find out one, how in the world do you land there? Because that is to, it, in, like, whenever you're like me and I'm just researching you, I'm thinking, well, that's genius because every single woman, God willing, is going to reach that midpoint of life. And they, I think women in general, as it relates to their bodies, they, they have a tough road to hoe whenever it comes to that lot, stage of life because they do go through so many hormonal changes. It's just that, that men, we have it. You know, our, test, our T levels will drop and we'll have some changes, but it's not to the extent that, that what women go through. So I thought that was genius that you landed there. So kind of let's start with that. How do you end up helping middle-aged women figure out how to adjust to their bodies changes that they're going through? How does all this happen? Yeah, it's a good question. And, and I'm going to switch one thing that you said. You said that I chose to kind of go for this niche. And it's it's weird, but it's almost like this niche chose me. Mm. And it's it's kind of a three-part story. Um, it's always the elephant in the room, any podcast I'm on. Because like you said, it's like, what the hell is this 30-year-old guy doing helping the 50 and 60-year-old women? And so we got to back it up to when I was like 13 years old. Growing up at my mom's house, she was really my only strong, consistent role model. Um, and at the age of 13, she saw I was starting to go down the wrong path, hang out with bad kids, do dumb shit. And at the same time, I was starting to get picked on. So two negative things, make poor choices, not be super confident in myself. She was already going to the gym for herself. And so after work one day, she comes home. She's like, Joe, you get your homework done? Yes. Is dinner ready? Yes. Chores done? Yes. Okay, great. Let's go to the gym. I'd love you to come with me. And I said yes, because I was getting picked on and, and logically all the guys at the gym had more muscle, more confidence. They weren't getting picked on. So it's like, that seems like the, the solution to this. I'll go. And I fell in love with it. And so number one, my mom got me to the gym and drastically changed the direction of my life. If she didn't, I'd probably be doing way worse things than I'm doing now. Um, and so I want to thank her. Number two, I, from 13 to 18, I, I still stay consistent in the gym, but I gain zero weight. I just grow taller and get skinnier. Um, and so then I'm, I'm still tall, lanky, skinny, not very athletic, not very smart, still getting picked on, no confidence. I graduate high school, go into college, start pursuing a career in the medical field. And because of that, I have to take courses like anatomy, physiology, kinesiology, nutrition, all the things that are going to change the body and help me understand the human body. And so I was my first guinea pig. I started applying all these things to myself, but also like any 18 year old kid in college, I start partying. And so I'm gaining muscle because I'm eating in this massive surplus and going to the gym, but I'm gaining way more fat than I am muscle. And so in a span of like a year to a year and a half, I go from five foot 11, 145 pounds up to 225. And then I have a new problem. I'm still not confident in myself. Now I'm just fat instead of skinny. And I didn't like that either. So I quit the partying. I dialed in everything I knew worked and I created the body that I live in today which is roughly 195 pounds, muscular, pretty lean. I perform well, I feel great. And growing up in a small town, people started to ask, like, Joe, I knew you when you were skinny, you had no confidence, you were kind of weird. Same thing when you were fat, still kind of weird, still not confident. Now, who the hell is this guy? Because we like him, he's confident, he looks good, he, he likes to do outdoor things. Can you help me achieve the same thing that you achieved? I was like, yeah, I'd love to. I'd love to help you avoid the things that I went through. And transparently, I thought I wanted to help people like me. You know, skinny kids gain some muscle or, or overweight kids lose some fat and just feel better about themselves. So I start running these online eight-week fat loss challenges and just advertising it in a natural way that came to me on Facebook and Instagram. And I got a ton of signups. I never looked at the names, though. Day one, I open up Zoom to start my first check-in call. 
and all the faces look, looking back at me look way more like my mom and nothing like me. And I was like, well, what happened here? I don't get this. And I came to the conclusion that growing up with my mom as, as my consistent role model and spending time with her and her friends, I learned to communicate in a way that naturally resonated with them. So I attracted those people. At the end of the first call, we were all laughing and having fun. At the end of the first eight weeks, all the women did amazing. And I was like, you know what? I don't care if this isn't what I was after. This is fun. I like this. So I kept rolling with it. At that time, I got my job in surgery. I was helping the doctor of surgery. My role was a surgical technologist. And again, getting pushed in this direction, I was the one male on a team of six or seven other women that did the same job I did. And again, like I said, pushing this direction, the higher ups thought it was an amazing idea to take the one male and stick him inside the OB and GYN based rooms. And so there I was again, learning more about the female body next to these surgeons that spent their entire adult career understanding it. And so I would ask them these questions. They thought it was just for surgery. Really, it was for me and my Hawaii Fit business. But I was like, hey doc, how did this lady get in here? What could she have done proactively to not be in here, right? And so now I'm taking this knowledge and I'm applying it to my clients outside of my day job. And so from there, results started to get better. I got more comfortable at this. And seven years later, here I am. The only late women I've worked with or people I've worked with for the past seven years are women 40, 50, 60 and older. Because number one, I recognize at a young age that if I want to change someone's life like mine, it's easier to do it by changing a mom's life because then it's going to trickle downstream and affect someone like me. I have fun with these ladies. And number three, I can help them in a massive way. That's fantastic. You know, one of the things I heard you say there too, I can relate. It's a lot better to be healthy and weird than fat and too, or too skinny and weird. So I'm all about being weird, but I want to be healthy <laughs> and weird. You know, and my wife tells me, my wife tells me all the time, she said, you realize you're weird, right? I'm like, yeah, of course I realize I'm weird, but at least I'm healthy and weird. Another thing that you described too, that was, it was kind of a throwaway statement, but it's one I want to go back to that I love is this body you live in. That's the thing, brother, that I see so many people and I, my heart goes out to them. If I go to a grocery store, or I'm just out and about, and, and you don't have to look too far these days, especially in, in the U.S., to see people living in these bodies, trapped in these bodies that are metabolically just disastrous. And I don't say that with judgment. I don't say that at shaming. I just say it with a, a heavy heart because there's nothing greater than being healthy. So I just think that it's so cool. I just, I, I wanted to go back to that because that's the way it's little, little phrases like that, that I want people to pick up on so that they don't get hung up on the vanity side of what we do and what we talk about. It's like, this is the, this is where your soul is housed. This is how you're going to function in this life and you have agency to decide. So I really just wanted to go back to that now. Yeah. Well said. And real quick to touch on that. Yeah. I think the place that you and I come from with it is like you said, it's like compassionate with a heavy heart and also understanding because number one, we saw it for me. I'm sure you've seen your own transformations. I'm sure you've transformed hundreds of lives. The reason we look at it this way is because we know there's another option for everyone we see. Yep. And I think that from their perspective, sometimes they don't think they have it in them. When you and I know that's bullshit yep. and everybody can do it and it really ain't that hard. That's exactly right. And that's going to be a perfect segue into what we're going to talk about. Because, And here's what I'd like to do, Joe, is so you mentioned it, that it was sort of a reaction. You looked and you're, the market came to you and you were faced with, all right, wow, look at all these moms, which as part of being a mom, getting to a certain age and being a female, you're going to reach this point of perimenopause, which is something that I had never dived into. I didn't know anything about perimenopause. And so you end up there. So here's what I'd like to do is one, here's what a lot of women, you just mentioned it. A lot of women, a lot of people, they think because of uh, biology and physiology that once you reach a certain age, there's so there's certain things you just can no longer do. You can't lift weights. You can't build lean body mass. You can't increase your VO2 max. And if you're a if you're a woman and you're now facing perimenopause and you're about to go into to menopause, your body's going to change so in such a and your hormones are going to change so drastically that you can't be lean any longer. You can't do these things. And so, I would like just at a base level 
talk to this audience a little bit about what happens during perimenopause, and then let's work our way back to discuss, okay, you know it's coming. You know, unless unless something happens, unless you die when you're 30, and you know, God willing, every woman that listens to this podcast today, that they're gonna live well beyond menopause and perimenopause and menopause and beyond. So then let's go back and talk about preparing for this thing. It's so weird too. And just real quick, and I'll shut up and let you talk. But it's like that's one of the things that I, I'm so glad we're finally getting to this point where people like the physicians that are my, the co-founders of, of Authentic Health Partners with me, they're much more interested in stopping these things before they mm -hmm. happen or preparing for the inevitable physiological, physiological changes our bodies are going to go through. And there are steps we can take as opposed to just the diagnose, prescribe. So with that said, what is perimenopause? What can women expect? And then let's start talking about how to be prepared for when, for when that day does come. Yeah, absolutely. And you actually nailed it earlier. You, you said something about people living in metabolically unhealthy bodies. And that's what we've aimed to fix for years. But before I get into that, the, the whole perimenopause talk, everybody goes straight to hormones, which they should, right? In perimenopause, that is when you stop having regular periods, right? Once you reach 12 months of no period, that's that marker is when you're actually in menopause. Um, and so perimenopause hormones are still there, but not all the time. They're up, they're down, it's like a roller coaster. Menopause, some of your sex hormones are basically at zero for many people. Um, and that does play a role. But what I've found to play a bigger role in a bigger population of people in perimenopause is what you said, metabolic health, aka the amount of muscle you have on your body. And we understand that as both men and women, women just have it worse than us men, that at the age of 30, if we don't do something about it, we're losing muscle year after year. And I don't know the statistic for 30, but I know at 40, women start to lose 1% of their muscle mass year after year. Yeah. They get to 50 and that number doubles. Now they're losing 2%. Once they get to 60, that number doubles. Now they're losing 4% of their muscle year after year. And we understand, like we, I say you and I, we understand that muscle is what allows us our food freedoms. That's what allows us high calorie numbers. And so, number one, the population that I work with, that generation, a lot of them have been on Weight Watchers or, or Jenny Craig or something like that since they were 15, 18. 25. So not only do they have the natural muscle loss at the age of 30 and beyond, they have muscle loss before that from these 1200 calorie diets they were put on as, as late teenagers. And so, okay, let's, we can take it a step further. They were also taught that skinny is the look, not strong. And so get in the gym, but you know what? Do cardio, which once again, accelerates your muscle loss. You have three things working against you. So reactively, we at Hoi Fit have worked for the past seven years to put muscle on these ladies and give them their damn life back. Well, I think that's, that's one of the things that a lot of people, they get into this idea that, well, I don't want to be bulky. I mean, how many times do you have clients? You know, they're, they're females, they come to you and they say, you know, the thing is, Joe, I don't want to be bulky. And little do they know, your body is working against you building bulk at every stage of life in, mm -hmm. in, 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 as you age. And I'm glad that you bring this up too, because women, again, women are going to lose muscle faster. We're all going to men, the same thing at 30, we start declining significantly in lean body mass. And then the older we get, the harder it is to put back on. And the best we can do, I think is you, but you can keep adding again. A lot of people don't think you can, but you not only can you keep adding. And I think there was a, um, there was a study and it was predominantly with elderly women and dude, the increase in lean body mass on these older women, I believe it was 70 and above. And I think it was like 70 to 86. I don't remember the exact age range, but it was who you would consider grandma age. And mm -hmm. they were able to put on lean body mass. And then the, the important thing about this too, and you correct me if I'm wrong, but this is the single best way to live longer after you, and to prevent falls, breaks, fractures, all these things that I think, you know, what is it like after the age of something like 65, it's not a real old number, something age of 65, you have something like a 40% chance of dying from a, from a fall and a broken hip. 
That's that's a big number. And the best way to reduce that is through building lean body mass, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's not exactly the body mass that's going to prevent the breaks, but through resistance training mm -hmm. and through that calorie surplus and lifting weights, not only are you signaling to your body to grow more muscle, you're you're signaling to your body it needs to keep your bones strong. Yeah. Which we know osteoporosis and osteopenia for women over 40 is a massive concern. Yep. Yep. All right. So, I I come in and I'm a female. I'm about 25 to 30 years old. Or I'll tell you what, I've got two daughters that are 23 and 24 years old. I send them to Hoy Fitness and I say, and they say, you know what, Joe? My dad said I'm supposed to come see you. That he said that I need to go ahead and start preparing for menopause now. My dad's kind of weird, but that's what I that's what he told me. What do you start? And you don't have to pick Rylan and Abby at 23 and 24, but whenever the client comes to you and they say, based on where they are in their in their life, I want to be prepared to go through the change or however you want to classify it as healthy as possible. What do you start telling them from a nutritional standpoint, from an exercise standpoint, from a, uh, a you know their sleep, all these things to make sure that they hit this natural evolution of life with the with hedging for the healthiest journey possible joe what do you tell them number one if that actually happened i would probably cry happy tears <laughs> right. like that would be the best thing i've heard in my entire coaching career um number two it let's use the exact example you just shared so these these girls have 16 and 17 years to prepare for this they're golden they will never have to worry in their life because number one i think i'm going to tell them four things number one the next three things I do need to fit within this one constraint. You need to enjoy it. Okay. So everything needs to come from you liking it. The foods you eat, you need to like. The exercise you do, you need to like. And you have to have, I don't know how weird fit this into liking it, but you have to have a good sleep routine, right? So just, just like how you end your days and start your days basically. And so not only is it going to come down to what you're eating, I actually don't really care that much about it. We want to prioritize your protein, yes, but it's going to come down more to how much you're eating, okay? And so, willing to bet, most women I talk to are under eating, and that's not serving them. So we're going to find out their maintenance calories. We're also going to figure out their current calories. If they're eating less than maintenance, we're going to bump them up. When we bump them up, it's going to give them more energy, better mood, better focus, better sleep, better life. It's also going to allow them to build muscle. So when we get them in the gym, very similar to what I just said about nutrition, it's gonna be more about how often are they in the gym? And more isn't always better because we understand that exercise is gonna make you worse. But when you pair that exercise with number four, the sleep aspect, the recovery, when you break your body down and then recover, you build it back stronger. So get in the gym three, maybe four days a week and lift some weights, right? I'm not saying you can't do cardio, but I'm saying you need to lift more than you run. If you do that, if you follow progressive overload, so just pushing yourself in, in one of five ways, that's it. Like, go do those four things for the rest of your life. Not only will you experience menopause and midlife better, you're also just going to look better in your 20s and 30s. And I don't think any 20-year-old is going to be mad at me for saying that. Yeah, you know, one of the things that Peter Atia always says is that whenever uh, people are in their 90s, they never go, gosh, I wish I didn't have so much muscle, you know, and it's just, it's just not something that we that we hear. And okay, so and let me what is your prescription for the protein consumption, like grams per body weight? What do you what do you think? Because I know that like, the national guidelines or whatever dietary guidelines are, are a little low in my opinion i can't remember it's something like yeah you know, it's a little lower. What, what do you think that should be w women should be looking to get as a general rule of thumb there are going to be outliers um, but i like one gram per pound of goal body weight and so if a woman wants to weigh 140 150 160 aim for that but i also tell them because we do have some rock stars that'll come in they're like joe i i hit my 140 but i had trouble not going over it's like Go ahead, girl. Like, eat more. Yeah. That's your minimum. Yeah. All right. Well, I want you to back up on that, too, because I don't know if the audience noticed, but you said one pound per, per gram or per one gram per pound of goal body weight. Talk yeah. a little bit about why. 
Yeah, you know, you know, Joe, I weigh 125 pounds. Shouldn't I get 125 grams? What are you you're telling me I need? I want to weigh 135 pounds. So why is that? Oh, wow. So you're taking this from a different example. You said this person was lighter than their goal weight. Yeah. Mm, interesting. See, that's not something I really address. Most okay. of the people I work with are are coming down to their goal. Okay. Um, so, well, no, okay. I got it. That's why I went, went back there. I, I heard it the wrong way. So you're saying I'm 135. I want to be 125. And so therefore yeah. I need 125 grams of protein. Correct. Okay. Yes, so that's it. it. That's it. That's why I, we confuse each other. Cause I, cause I, I heard it wrong. Okay. Got it now. All right. So here's the net, here's the next big one is, and this is the thing too, cause I don't want people to listen to this podcast and go, Oh crap. I'm, 40 years old, I haven't done any of this, so throw my hands in the air. So now, mm -hmm. instead of my daughters coming to you at 23 and 24 and freaking you out because they're so on the ball with all these years left and willing to do everything you say, now we've got a 45-year-old woman that is metabolically challenged, bad sleep patterns, and all of a sudden she's missing periods, she doesn't want to have sex, she's just like, she's lethargic, and she comes to Joe saying, is it just too late for me? What do you say? Yeah, so I mean, it, it's so easy to say from my point of view because I have thousands of success stories that are her, right? Like I said, I've worked with men 40, 50, 60 plus for the last seven years. No, it's not too late. Like, are you gonna build, are you gonna have as much muscle at 45 as the 23 year old that started at 23? No, you're not going to, but it doesn't matter. You're not running the same race anymore. Stay in your lane, eyes forward, and do what you can do about what you're working with. So it's a, the same exact answers are true. The top four things, enjoy what you do, look at how much you eat and prioritize protein, enjoy how you exercise, do it three to four times a week with a priority on strength, and enjoy your sleep routine by how you go to bed and how you wake up. And then the next thought that is in many of your listeners' heads, if, the, if they're women, is, well, Joe, I think it's my, my hormones, or I think it's this, or I think it's that. And you know what? You could be right. But you do not have the right to point the finger at that until you do those four things consistently for, I would say, three months. So, you know, from your mouth to God's ear, thank you for saying that. That's one of the things that frustrates me the most <laughs> is people, they automatically, look, the same people who will say, I'm so sick of Western medicine and the diagnosis and prescribe are the same people that will come to Joe Hoy Fitness and say, what supplements do I need to be on? Well, how the hell should I know if I don't know what you're eating? I don't know how you're sleeping. I don't know, you know, all these, have you done your blood tests? You know, mm -hmm. there's, there is no panacea that you're going to find in a bottle. And yet Joe, so, cause I get the same thing, especially, you know, being the co-founder of a supplement company, people come and say, do I need to take creatine? Do I need to take this? Do I need to take that? Well, I don't know. I mean, there mm -hmm. are some baseline. Yes. We have a foundational stack that's based on saying kind of like what you're talking about, you know, thousands of patients that Dr. Gus Vickery has seen over the years with deficits. But if you're taking it up a notch and what have you done to try? I just had this conversation with a good buddy of mine. Uh, he called me and he's looking at doing uh, testosterone replacement therapy. Mm -hmm. And he asked me about it and dude, he's young. He's younger than me. He's like 42, 43. And I said, first of all, you're too young, I think. And I said, now I'm not saying that you shouldn't do it. And I'm not, I'm not totally against, uh, TRT and t but I am against you doing it at a young age without having tried every single natural remedy possible by like heavy resistance training, upping your resistance mm -hmm. training, doing the things, making sure you dial in your sleep, making sure you dial in your protein, all these different things before you do that. And if you go through all those things and you're still getting just bottom numbers, okay, maybe. It's the same thing with women because I think they have just been conditioned to think that when this happens, well, boom, it's time to start taking the hormone pills, the thyroid medicines, all these different things. And so I'm, I'm so glad to hear you say that. Now, while we're on that kind of line of thought, Joe, what are some of those other just just myths at this point, or even, maybe not myths, but just old science versus kind of what we've learned in, in 2000 up to 2024 that a lot of your 
your your patients, and this, this can be female or male. I don't want to just you know keep this all about the females, but but your your clients have come in and that they're they're still kind of in this mindset that oh I have to be on a keto diet, oh I have to do this. Are there some of those myths that you're just like ready to just blow up and get out of the way? Yeah. So number one, any diet, mm -hmm. like our our business name as of like as of ten days ago is called Diet Detox. Mm -hmm. And, and what that means is we're detoxifying people's body from the damage that past diets have done. I don't like any diet and I don't think anybody needs one. Um, so number one, let's kill all diets. Number two, number two, three, and four, carbs are bad, sugar is bad, potatoes are bad. Like just stop. All like any carb gets converted to sugar in your body. So that's that whole sugar is bad thing is baloney. Potatoes are grown from the earth. Argue that one to me. And then especially for women over 40, carbs are actually your best friend. And, and here's, a quick, here's a quick win that any woman over 40 listening can apply. If you sleep like shit at night, go to bed having complex carbs in your belly. Sweet potatoes, oats, brown rice. Wake up and send me an email and tell me how you slept. Yeah. Guarantee you it's better than you slept in the last five years. Yeah, yeah. No, that's, I'm glad you said that because that's one of the things that Again, I get asked a lot, what is the best diet? Or, or people will tell me, like, my uh, my youngest daughter, she uh, she was telling me how her boss has gone on this vegan diet because he's older and, and somebody has told him that that's what he needs to do. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, are you kidding me? And the guy's like 72. And I'm like, wait a minute. Somebody told this guy at 72 years old he needs to go on a vegan diet. Vegans, don't get mad at me. I'm just saying that is not the best way to build lean body mass is to be on a vegan diet, especially when you're 72 freaking years old. And I told Abby, I was like, please, let me, let, have, tell him to call me. You know, <laughs> like, because that's yep. just, but that's the thing. We hear these very simplistic ideas like all carbs are bad, all sugar is bad. I think, um, do you ever keep up with any of Lane Norton's work? Do you ever watch what uh, Bio Lane, he, he researcher? I, I try to stay in my own lane yeah. because it's just a distraction, but yeah. I do like the guy, yeah. of course. He, I think Lane does a good job from a research standpoint of pointing out all this, the, the below the headlines of the studies that get done. And that's what I love. It's like when you have a study that says like red meat leads to cancer or something like that, he will actually go through and was it a clinically controlled trial? You know, random, was it randomized? What, what is the legitimacy of the study? I think people, they get wrapped up in these, this clickbait and these headlines and just kind of these old ways of thinking that, that cause them to think, oh my gosh, I can't touch carbs. And so, so yeah, I think that's important. Now, here's another thing. So what if I have, and you kind of touched on this earlier, you have a client that comes to you and says, you know what, Joe, I've never trained in my life. I've never done anything. I've never touched a weight. I've ne I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a girly girl who has never lifted yeah. weights. I've never done anything. Are you sure that I can do this? And if so, what are you going to prescribe to me? How are you going to get me started? Yeah, that's a good point. I'm glad you brought that up because you and I just spent, God, the last, what, 30 minutes talking about how I don't care if you're a man or woman or what age you are, you need to be in the gym lifting weight. Yeah. And that to the person you just presented to me is terrifying mm -hmm. because they see, they see me in the gym, like back squatting 300 pounds and, and deadlifting heavy and, and grunting and doing all this stuff. And they're like, oh, number one, I don't want to look like him. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be near him and I don't want to smell him. <laughs> right. I ain't going. Right. Um, and, but you don't need to on day one. You just need to start somewhere. And so oftentimes we'll start with at home in the comfort of your living room with nobody around at home body weight exercises. Let's start squatting on your sofa or on a box and let's do some push ups with your arms on the sofa. And then, hey, you're good at that. Let's do a full range of motion exercise. Feeling good? Let's get you some light bands. Still feeling good? Let's go to heavier bands. Okay. I'm proud of you. You've seen tremendous progress. I'm going to buy you a set of dumbbells and ship to your house. Oh, wow. Those dumbbells are too light now. I ain't buying you new ones. Time to go get a gym membership. And now when you're at the gym, I just want you to walk on the treadmill for your first three days and watch everybody using every machine and just take mental note of what it looks like. And at the end of those workouts, go and try two machines. That's it. You've won the day. Yeah. Now week two, Let's do 20 minutes of strength. 
then 40, then an hour. Before you know it, your full workout is free weights using a barbell or a dumbbell, and you feel so freaking comfortable doing it. But three months ago, you were terrified. Yeah, yeah. And would you say that some of those early clients like that, are they kind of blown away by, by how drastically their strength will increase in such a short period of time? Man, I got a neighbor. She lives down the road. She's a client of ours. And she's, she's in her late 60s, early 70s. And she, she said in our coaching group chat with all of our clients, all of our coaches, she's like, guys, you're going to laugh at me, but I just reached out for the remote tonight. I'm watching my favorite TV show. And at the corner of my eye, I saw my bicep and tricep, and I have never seen that in my life. She's like, I've been going to the gym for two and a half months. That's awesome. And I was like, congrats. Welcome to your new life. Yeah. And she feels better now. <laughs> God, she's doing more now than she did in her 40s. That's so awesome. All right. Now let's let's talk a little bit about the sex drive. I know this is something that a lot of women care about more than what people probably think. Tell me about some of the, uh, the, the best case scenarios and some of the changes that can happen in this area of life. And, and, and by the way, Joe, I got to believe you've had clients. It wasn't just about hormone imbalance. It wasn't about uh, just all the physiological changes, but a lot of it, I got to believe there's been some mental changes, some confidence changes that then lead to uh, a, a heightened sex drive. Can I talk a little bit about that? Because I do think that's more important than what people want to talk about. Yeah. So, wow. We're going to cover a lot here if I can remember all of it. Um, sorry, someone's calling me. So number one, the biggest fix to that problem is calories, mm -hmm. right? You start giving somebody more calories and number one, many of their hormonal problems are gone, right? Because their body was so stressed. It was, it was searching for energy. It wasn't getting that. It was just in panic mode. The hormones are everywhere. Once you give it what it needs, things stabilize. Once things stabilize, you feel way better. Once you feel way better, you're wanting to have sex more, okay. right? Next, we, we don't just do nutrition exercise coaching. We do a whole lot of mindset, like you said. And when you can start to shift the lens that somebody looks at life through, and more importantly, looks at themselves through, you build massive confidence in them. And again, like if you feel more confident, everything's gonna change. I love that. And that's, so what do you do? And I think that's important. It's one of the things that I try to talk a lot about. I mean, I've taught courses on mindset and, you know, how to have a growth mindset as well as just tiny habits from BJ Fogg's work and atomic habits, which is basically just a mm -hmm. repackaged, well-marketed version of BJ Fogg's research. Uh, how do you get your clients to kind of start to adopt these mental changes and then tapping into their neurochemistry to make the things that you're trying to teach them sustainable and available for the long haul. What are some of the, the tactics that you use? Yeah. So number one, like you just said, you mentioned a couple books. Books are a big thing that we will prescribe mm -hmm. and that's going to change from person to person. Um, I, to be honest with you, and it's funny you said that, obviously I've read, I've heard of Atomic Habits. I've never heard of BJ Fogg. So uh, the whole marketing thing is I'm going to look him up. Yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm, you'll, you'll love, seriously, you will love what happened was, if I'm not mistaken, so James Clear writes Atomic Habits, explodes, and BJ Fogg realizes this is so much of my methodology. And, and he references, uh, uh, James Clear references him, and BJ Fogg is a Stanford researcher that basically came up with a lot of the actual research that led to Atomic Habits. So Tiny Habits is the one that uh, hmm. you'll want to grab from BJ Fogg. You will love it, and I can almost assure you you're going to be putting it in some of your clients' hands because it talks ex like where what you described with the the lady that comes to you that's never trained before and you start her out with bands and then work up to bigger bands until you're sending her weights. You literally outlined tiny habits. I mean, that's really what it is. So I think you'll really, I think you'll enjoy it, man. That's awesome. It just went on my on my to read list. I'm dead serious. Awesome. Um, so yeah, we look at books. My Tuesday group calls with all of our clients is generally always mindset. And what I like to do is I like to read a book and learn and just be one step ahead of my clients. Mm -hmm. I like to give them everything I learned right away because number one, selfishly, it helps me get better at what I learned. Number two, it helps them move forward. So I teach a lot of mindset on my group calls. Um, also just looking at the community, 
our new clients look up to our veteran clients. And that shows a lot because oftentimes both clients started at the same place. One's just further along in the process. And so the next one, the new one, knows it's possible for them too. They just need to follow the steps. Um, one practice I have really been in love with lately for our clients is making them outline their dream outcome, right? What do they have in their life? What do they have in their body? What do they have in their health? Okay, now you have all that. Close your eyes for a minute and imagine how you're acting now that you have all those things. Then I write it down for them. I share my, my computer screen and I write down, well, I'm more confident. If I was more confident, it would look like me going and starting new conversations with new people or me going and asking my boss for a raise or me doing this. I'm like, great, here's the deal. If you want all the things you said you want, you need to do all the things you said you were just doing. So tomorrow when you wake up, go do it. Yeah. And the ones that apply that change faster than anything I've ever seen in my life. Yeah, I think that's fantastic. And that kind of touches into some of those identity-based habits that I think are mm -hmm. the single most powerful of, I mean, there's all sorts of strategies that you can, you can get to, but like, I know for me, man, uh, one of the biggest changes in my life was when I decided to not drink alcohol and it wasn't, a, it wasn't based on scruples or that, you know, anything like that. It was just, if I'm going to be the absolute healthiest, most clear thinking version of myself, it's just not going to play a part. And now it's like, I couldn't imagine, you know, I've, I've done this before in a class where I pull out a cigarette and act like I'm about to light it, you know, just kind of like I'm talking like you and I are talking right now. And I'm like, and then I'll stop. and I go, no, that looks kind of weird, right? I mean, Jason, right? The improve always and always dude, the healthy CEO firing up a ciggy that does not match with my identity. And it's the same thing with alcohol. It just nothing wrong with it. I, I think if people want to go have a cocktail in one swamp, fine, but it just doesn't blend with my identity. And so I think that's so important what you just said and I had a great, I had a couple on the show a few weeks ago that just up and moved to France. I mean, it's one of those, the, one of those bold moves you've ever seen there. They bought a house about an hour South of Paris and they're remodeling it. And one of the things, and the, the husband who not only is now an incredibly successful content creator, he also is very much involved in the stuff that you and I are talking about just as part of his life, a growth mindset yeah. and doing these identity based habits. And he said, one of the things that he has had to start doing is getting out and going to like little coffee shops and talking to people because that's not, that's who he wants to be. He wants to be more extroverted. And so you got to do the thing you want to be. And so I think that's so critical and it all ties into those identity based habits to where you're, if your if your actions and your identity are butting heads, one of them's going to give. And, and so I think that's so important that people hear that. And a lot of it is that, and, and tell me this, have you ever had that client where they constantly look at, like you're talking about the veterans in your course, where your newbies are looking at the veterans and always referring to them, the veterans, I want to be healthy like them, instead of going, no, you're here now, you're in the tribe, you are one of them, just because you're not where they are, doesn't mean you're not one of them. Do you ever deal with that? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, all the time. And it's, it's just a time conversation, mm -hmm. right? It's like, just like you said, I'm, I'm just going to reiterate what you said. Like you are them, mm -hmm. you are where they are. You are doing everything they are doing. The only thing you need to do is give time, time. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's like, and there's so many people, it's like that. And that's why I love about mindset. I'm sure if you teach on mindset, you've probably seen some of Carol Dweck's work. And the biggest thing that oh, yeah. Carol Dweck, what she realized was this powerful word yet. And I, dude, I, I am a, I am a recovering fixed mindset. I mean, like, and I, I mean, I grew up as the, as long as I look good, no one will know that I really suck at this. So I got to make sure I look good. And therefore <laughs> I'm not going to take on big challenges because if I do suck, people will realize I'm not quite the athlete or quite this smart or whatever as I thought I was. And and so now I, to this day at 49 years old, man, I will find myself beating the hell out of myself mentally and then go, no, you don't suck at this. You're just not good at this yet, or you're not able yes. to do this yet. It doesn't mean I'm always going to be a virtuoso. It doesn't mean I'm always going to master something, but we can always, no matter where the benchmark is, we can always get better and where, and like you, again, the neophytes to the veterans. Yeah. You're not there yet you're not able to dial in your sleep yet you're not able to restrict those calories to get get it really dialed in yet you're the, and when just that yet it tells your brain 
we're on a trajectory. We're not at a wall. We're not at an impasse. We're, we're just, we're moving. And dude, I think that has been one of the most powerful motivators and mindset movers for me is just that tiny three little word. That little three word, that three letter word, and just the words you say to yourself overall. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, it's funny you mentioned Carol though, because I'm reading her book mindset yeah, it's right good. now. Yeah, it's good stuff. And her, there's a, uh, you know, one of the things too, I think for the parents listening out there, uh, Carol Dweck's work started with children. So if you're a parent, that's one of the most important things. Like I, my, I have a, uh, I have a nephew that's just off the charts smart. And his parents, they know that they don't tell him how smart he is. They tell him how hard he's worked. They tell him how much, yes. how hard he tried. It's all about the effort. So, so folks listening to this, mindsets and the work of Carol Dweck is good for not only you, but also your children. And it's never too late to start to alter these mindsets. Man, it's funny you say that. Um, I, I reached a point in the book last night to where that is the exact thought I had. I don't have any kids. I don't know if I will. Mm -hmm. If I do, I would be so excited to teach them and, and raise them the way that I think is right to instill that growth mindset from day one. Yeah, yeah. It would just be such a fun thing to basically make this kid unstoppable yeah. in terms of what he knows he can achieve. Yeah, yeah, 100%. And one of the things I love about Carol Dweck, again, another, she actually works, uh, they, she might be in the same department as BJ Fogg, but um, one of the things I love about her work is it's not this touchy feely ooey gooey stuff like give everybody a trophy and make them feel good but one of the things that she says you've probably read about it is that that's where this whole yet thing came from she was i think in chicago observing some students and this teacher was giving a grade of not yet and instead of a b or c and instead of failing not yet and so the kid was taking this as not that I failed. I just haven't mastered or passed yet. There is a, there's a future for me. It's, and so that's where she started cluing into this idea. And so I think that is so cool. And, and again, I could harp on this forever. It, people that listen to the Jason Wright show, they know I talk about growth mindset a lot. As a matter of fact, I'm actually revising my massively transformative mindsets, which, which is essentially my own branding for a growth mindset, because it is, it is transformational if you understand these concepts. So, so it's really encouraging to hear that you're dialing into that for your clients as well, man. Yeah, I love it. It's, I think that comes before anything. Yep. Yep. 100%. All right. So tell me, I got to know, tell me about your routine. I love knowing what people are doing, kind of how you're keeping your mind sharp. And this is what I love about somebody like you. It's not just about, uh, what you're eating and all, all the, you know, the, the circadian rhythm stuff, although I want to hear some of that, but kind of what do you do to keep your mind sharp, to stay on focus? And then you're also an entrepreneur, which is something I love to talk about. How are you making sure to keep that on balance? Just kind of what are some of the best practices for Joe Hoy Fitness as it relates to that party of one? Yeah, for sure. So you mentioned balance, and I would say I'm probably not balanced right now, which I'm fine with. Um, I think that overall my life from beginning to end should be balanced. It shouldn't be in balance 24-7. Mm -hmm. um, with that being said, pretty simple guy, right? get my eight hours of sleep, do the best I can, understand that I'm not perfect and my sleep won't be perfect all the time. Um, I prioritize, God, it's everything I just told everyone to do. I prioritize my, my amount of calories and my protein as much as possible and also make sure I enjoy it. So last night I made this tasty little protein mug cake because I wanted it. And the night before that, I finished off a pint of ice cream. Not all at once, but I finished it off. Um, and so for exercise, Three days a week, strength training, really, really heavy. Like, I don't have fun when I'm there mm -hmm. most of the time. But I feel good after, and that's what I'm after. Um, again, practicing what I preach, stepping into that higher level self. So in order to have all the things I want, I need to live in that identity that does that. And so one of the things I'm starting next week is jujitsu. I did martial arts when I was younger, stepped away from it, really miss it. So the higher level self is doing that. So I start next week. Um, and, and that's it. I'm, I'm constantly revising what I want in the future, looking at what my identity is like then and, and doing that. So that's really it. It's, it's not 
super complicated or fancy. All right. So I'm going to ask you what's going to seem like a Brocephus question, but I want to know because you have that you have taught so much about the um, resistance training, which for good reason, it's so, so very important. Um, I tell you, Joe Hoy, you're, you're a fitness expert. You've been on the Jason Wright show. So that means you must be really, really amazing. Um, if, uh, and you can only recommend three resistant. Yeah, it's a three part circuit. That's it. There are only three exercises that you can recommend to this client. That's all they'll do three, no more. What are those three moves that you're going to tell that client to do? Squat, deadlift, press, boom, go home. Okay. That's it. Okay. And that's, <laughs> um, and, tell, and, and let's talk a little bit about, cause a lot of people, I guarantee, man, there's a lot of people listening to this that have never done a deadlift in their life. Why is it so important? Well, they're compound movements, meaning you're moving more, you're moving from more than one joint at a time. And so the really simple way to explain this is if we do a bicep curl, we all know what a bicep curl is. It's hinging at your elbow, right? That's the only joint that is moving. And when I say joints, we have our ankles, our knees, our hips, our shoulders, our elbows and our wrists. Um, so we're hinging at our elbow from a bicep curl. If I switch to a pull up or a lat pull down, now I'm hinging or moving at my elbow and my shoulder. So no longer am I just working one muscle, I'm working multiple muscles in the same amount of time, meaning I'm being way more efficient with what I'm doing in the gym, meaning more bang for my buck. So if we wanna do that, then we want to do compound movements, so anything that moves two joints at a time or more. And we also want to think about which movements work the biggest muscles. So there you go. Your squat, your deadlift, your press. And do you think on, on the squats, are you doing just a back barbell squat? Or are you doing a front squat? Do you have a preference? Or is it just as long as I'm doing some sort of a, a weighted squat, I'm there, sumo, uh, sumo squat, goblet, what do you, what's your recommendation? For the average person, I'd say a back squat. Yeah. If we're talking about me, I really like front squats. Okay. Just I, I just find them fun. It also pulls me forward, so I have to use my core a little bit more. Yeah. Um, I know they're they're quad focused, but that's just me getting a little bit nerdy. Okay. And if I'm going to do deadlifts, but I've never done them, but Joe always said that I need to do them because I want to live longer, uh, and I don't have a squat rack, you know, or anything like that. Dumbbell deadlift is that okay? And do I do like a suitcase? And what's the proper form? What do you you know? What do you suggest? Yeah, so anything is better than nothing. Okay. Um, if you don't have dumbbells, you have a gallon of milk, you have a cinder block, you have a laundry detergent bottle, you have something that's heavy. Pick the thing up off the ground, put it back down. Keep your back straight, your head in line with your spine. Um, God, keep your joints stacked above each other for the most part. So ankles, knees, hips, shoulders, all above each other. Stand straight up, try to lift your butt and your shoulders at the same time. And then once your legs are extended, extend at your hips. Am I better off doing this once, twice, three times a week? Mm, I mean, if we're just doing those three exercises, I'd love to see people do them three times a week. Okay. Um, Cause like the volume you're doing is not gonna be overexerting, but anything is better than nothing once again. So start somewhere. Got it. All right, Joe Hoy, I got a hard stop to get you out of here, brother, by 1055. How can people keep up with you, find out more about you, and potentially engage you should they decide to? Absolutely. So, number one, if it's okay with you, Jason, I'd love to do a pretty crazy giveaway. Yeah. Um, but before that, anybody can find me at Joe Hoy, super searchable, or joe.dietdetox on Instagram. And then, since I got the, the yes of approval, if anybody resonated with what I say, I want to give one listener three months of free coaching. Wow. That is truly three months, no strings attached. You're not going to get in there and we're going to sell you supplements, nothing like that. We're going to coach you for free for three months. And so, Jason, I'll send you a form we can put in the show notes. Okay. And I'll need, I'll need name, phone number, email. That's how I contact you if you're the winner. And then why? The last box is why. And that means why do you think you should be the winner of three months of free coaching? And you have to sell me because that's how I'm picking the winner. Fantastic. Joe Hoy, Hoy Fitness, dude. This was great, man. Thank you so much for, for being here today, brother. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, folks. This. Thanks for listening. He's Joe. I'm Jason. We're out. Fantastic. Joe Hoy, Hoy Fitness, dude. This was great, man. Thank you so much for, for being here today, brother. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, appreciate folks. This. Thanks for listening. He's Joe. I'm Jason. We're out.
Hey, if you enjoyed this content, please consider clicking like or subscribe. I would appreciate it so much. Continue to improve always in all ways.